Be sure to friend us on Facebook. You can do it right now. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for us at keyword Voice America. The following program is being brought to you on the 7th Wave Network. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit 7thWaveNetwork.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit VoiceAmerica.com. The views and ideas. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Good morning, and welcome to Being Here with host Ariel and Shia Kane. The Canes will take you on an exciting exploration, which will open the door to living in the moment. Now, here are your hosts, Ariel and Shia. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to our show. I'm Ariel. I'm Shia. And welcome to Being Here. We have an exciting show today. Very exciting show tonight. We have our friend and talented, talented fellow, Alan Cohen. He's, He's an author. He's written uh, 24, 24 books. And wow. CDs. 24. That's pretty cool. We'll tell you more about him in a minute uh, and about his new book, Enough Already, The Power of Radical Contentment. Isn't that a great idea? But first... Let's talk about listening. Because we want you to get the most out of the show today. Really. And most people listen to see if they already know what's being talked about or if they agree with what's being said or they disagree with what's being said or they're forming what they're going to say when the speaker stops talking. Um, or to compare, to, to compare styles, to compare, for instance, what Alan has to say to what you may have heard on this show before. Right. So you, when you do that, you step out of the moment to think. And this is all about... This is all about getting into the current moment of your life because one of the byproducts of that is your life transforms. By the way, just like to remind all of you who are with us for the first time that Shy and I finish each other's sentences. So when we do... <laughs> Please don't be surprised. <laughs> or offend yourselves. Yeah, we, we, uh, we wouldn't want to do that. No, we wouldn't want to do that. Oh, well, we, we might want to do that. I, I don't... I don't so. think so. Right. So... Today... See if you can engage with your ears and really listen to what Alan has to say from his perspective or the three of us as we chat. And the other thing is to also listen with your body. Your body has a truth and things resonate. And Sometimes we get so busy thinking that we forget to pay attention to how our body feels. Well, if you truly listen to what another person is saying from their point of view, it will pull you out of your thoughts won't be thinking about what they're saying. You'll, you'll be allowing what they're saying to deeply impact you, which right. can only be good. Then life gets very profound. Yes. Let me tell you a little bit about Alan. Please, tell us about Alan. I shall. As Shai mentioned uh, at the top of the show, he's the author of 24 popular inspirational books and CDs, including the best-selling The Dragon doesn't live here anymore. you got to love that title. The award-winning uh, Deep Breath of Life and the classic Are You As Happy As Your Dog? I, I love that title. Uh, he's a contributing... I keep, I keep seeing a Jack Russell Terrier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a happy dog. That's right. He's a, a contributing writer for the New York Times number one best-selling Chicken Soup of the Soul. His books have been translated into 24 foreign languages he has been a uh, companion of ours back from when we did an Earth Conference in Bali in the early 90s, and we're very pleased to have him on the show. And we're very pleased to call him our friend. So welcome to the show, Alan. It's a treat to have you here. Oh, this is fun for me, too. Thank you. Uh, we have really been enjoying having your book, Enough Already, That Power of Radical Contentment. I just adore the idea of radical contentment. So many people are discontented. and I was, Radically discontented. I was thinking about it uh, yesterday in the shower when the water was so warm and kings and queens, a few 
hundred years, years ago, ago. <laughs> didn't have a shower that put hot, deliciously hot water over our bodies. And I, I, I feel like people um, they take didn't for have granted heating or air conditioning either. So, tell people a little bit about your book. The book evolved out of my own journey, at which at one point I realized that if I wasn't happy now, I probably was never going to be. <laughs> and that I could never get enough more stuff to make me happier. So rather than seeking more stuff, I began to practice enjoying and appreciating and celebrating what I have right where I am. And I experienced a very profound shift, and I realized that happiness has very little to do with stuff and a lot to do with attitude. And when I shifted my attitude, I started to feel really good. And so out of this experiment of seeing through the eyes of enoughness, this book just kind of overflowed, and I got all kinds of angles on it that were interesting to me to write about and hopefully interesting for people to read about. Mm. Yeah, that's one of the things that you were talking about at the, the very beginning. If you get his book, which you can get it, wherever books are sold, you can certainly uh, get it on Amazon. You were talking about how the book is all about the central theme that you have enough because you are enough and you deserve enough, and enough is always available, right. and that everything radiates out from that. Right. Well, everything it, else is details, isn't it? Um, you know, the reason that people don't feel they have enough is because they don't believe they are enough. So you can never manipulate the chess pieces enough to create enough, you have to source enough from inside out. And once you realize that you're enough just as you are with your wrinkles or your fat or your sagging boobs or whatever you tend to judge yourself for, if you can find perfection right where you stand, suddenly everything around you takes on the air of perfection and you live in a new world with a new thought. It's just an amazing phenomenon. Well, you know... That's our second principle of instantaneous transformation, basically. Yes. That you can only be exactly as you are in the current moment of your life. You can't change that because the moment goes by too fast. Well, if you look in the dictionary, under the definition of perfection, it says whole, complete, immutable, uh, lacking no component part. Just like the moment. So you're perfect in each moment of your life. The only thing is we've been raised in a culture that teaches us that we're imperfect and we need to achieve or get something in order to be worthy of being okay. Right, right. Someone once said that uh, we started out fine and then we got defined. <laughs> now, now we're getting refined. We're, we're just getting back to who we were before we forgot. Right. right, before we got enculturated into the, the standards and mores of whatever culture you're, you've been dipped right. in. Exactly, exactly. You know, you talk in several chapters about gratitude and being grateful, and you were touching on it here. If somebody's listening today and they find themselves being hard on themselves for their fat or their saggy boobs or their lack of money, or, what would you suggest for them? Where, would they, where should they start? Well, there's a wonderful process that I teach, and I know you, you do as well, perhaps by the, another name, called reframing, which means that uh, the facts of a situation are always neutral. It's how you interpret them, what you make of them, that makes you happy or unhappy. I had a chance to reframe this morning. Um, we live out in the country, and occasionally we get rats uh, in and around our house, and so a couple of years ago we got a cat... Uh, to get rid of the rats because we didn't want to poison them. And uh, so this morning um, I came down from this glorious meditation and I found this uh, dead rat on our living room floor with its head cut off and its guts hanging out. And it was, it was not a happy sight after meditation. And so I did what I needed to do to remove it. And uh, Dee, my partner, said, well, Thank goodness the cat's doing her job. <laughs> That's definitely right. framing and it. So, you know, there's two ways to look at everything. It was a gross experience to see that and remove it, granted. But then the reason that it happened was actually, you know, for the purpose we had chosen. So, you know, when I looked at it being grateful to the cat instead of being angry at the cat or the rat, well, suddenly, you know, it was not a bad experience. It was a helpful experience. Right. I think most people forget to have... Gratitude just as a 
well, attitude. I, I think most people get lost in this idea that whatever's going on in their life isn't it, and someday something right. or some things, some material possessions, some increase in, in money, something, a relationship, something's going to save them from the current moment of their lives. Right, right. And that's such a poisoning thing. And, and one thing I learned from the S training, weren't you an S trainer once, uh, Shia? I, I was. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing I always remember for that was uh, this is as it as it gets. You know, there's, there's never going to be any more it than there is now, so if you don't get it now, you're probably not going to get it later unless you That's, that's right. To. This is all there is, Yeah. really. This moment of our lives is everything. It's yeah. not when we get done with this radio show, our life will begin. This is our life in this moment. Right. And, and people waste precious, precious moments of their lives, which, and, and, and life is, is finite, you know. Uh, we waste it in complaining to ourselves that we don't like the way things are. Right. Right. Well, that's part of why we often or regularly talk about listening at the top of our shows, because when you listen to actually listen, you're being here as opposed to listen to fix something in the future and get ahead and get somewhere. Uh, you're far better off being here than trying to get away from where you are. Right. I got to go back to something. You said I was an S trainer. I was never an S trainer. I was a trainer candidate. I was in a program to train me to be a trainer, but I so you trained pieces, but you never. I, I did pieces of the training, but I I was never a quote S trainer. I just want to be clear about that. Well, you're you're a trainer in my heart, so well, I, I I am I now. <laughs> I'm just no longer associated with S, it, which was it. the program that. Took place. I did the S training in nineteen seventy three. Was it seventy two? Wow! I wow. mean, you know, a, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and yes, uh, that was a very powerful experience for me. But you know, like it, 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 as with all things, you have to look and see what your truth is. Right. And right. mine was a, a, a different truth that I had to find sometime later on. Right. And it reminds me of what you said about how you looked and saw that if you weren't happy, nothing was going to get you happy. Right. I had a, I had a similar uh, epiphany where I realized that this was, the, even though I understood it intellectually, this was the only moment of my life, and I couldn't be different than I was, so I stopped trying to work on myself to right. get me to be a better me, and life turned out really good. What a concept, loving yourself as you are. That's the radical part of contentment. That's why I called it radical contentment as my subtitle, because for, for a human being on the planet Earth to love him or herself just as he or she is, or just as life is, it's absolutely radical. It's a very, very small percentage of people who are willing to do that, and it's actually the doorway out of hell. <laughs> absolutely. But, you know, like, there are very few of us, Alan, that are, in compared to the 7 billion people on the planet, right. that see life that way. Most people are striving just to survive. Right, right. So there's no space to look at their behavior in a way like there's another possibility. Right, well said. One of the things that's lovely, too, though, Alan, in being with you, is that I am certain our listeners today are... If they're listening, they're starting to relax into themselves uh -huh. and able to feel it for themselves. It's a it, it it's a communicable ease. Uh, I love that. A great expression. <laughs> well, let's let's talk a moment about ease as a spiritual path. I know that you guys are into that too. And you know what I what I practice or try to practice or help others practice is that. The idea that life has to be a struggle is a, is a belief system that we've learned, and it's not really true. It's not how we were born to live. Even though many people are struggling and most people are struggling, uh, I invite everyone who's listening to test and challenge the idea that there has to be struggle in order to grow. I think sometimes we can grow through struggle, but I think we grow more through joy and ease and celebration 
and, and, and finding good before us rather than bucking something or trying to make something happen that doesn't want to happen. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. I get reminded of the title of our first book, Working on Yourself Doesn't Work. Yeah, great title. When you're, great working, title. when you're working on yourself, you're, you're saying that there's something wrong with you, that you're deficient in some way, that you need to then change or fix yourself. Right. If, if people could start loving themselves the way they are, then uh, they'd be a lot less frustrated with life. I also think people sandwich in as a, a layer of success if they struggled in the learning curve of something and they ultimately succeed. The mind sandwiches it in, and then you think that you need that struggle. It's integral to the success. And I love you challenging people to challenge that idea. The best things that have ever happened to me have come not because I tried, but because I was ready. Uh, and I know one of your books is Instantaneous Enlightenment, or that's one of your themes. And I look back on my life, and I see that there's a fact of what I call grace, which means that life is trying to love me, trying to help me, trying to give to me, and it's in my moments of openness that I receive that. I look back on all the things I tried to make happen, and some of them happened, most of them didn't, and it's almost as if there's a platter, there's a great feast that's set before us, and the universe is saying, would you care to sit down and enjoy this? And we say, no, no, I have to earn this, I have to earn this. But love is given not through earning, but by grace. And that's, that's a theme that I'm practicing with, and it really works for me. I love that. We, it's a perfect segue. It, yeah, because we, we have to take a break now. And we're going to love this break. And yes, we'll, we'll, we'll love this break. We'll it's be, be back a great break. with Alan. Yeah, so, so do come, come on, on back. back and don't miss being, being here. here. Welcome back. back. <laughs> I'm Ariel. At least I most speak, too. I'm Shia. And we're... And our, our guest today is Alan Cohn. Um, Welcome back, Alan. Thank you. Welcome back to you. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, you're talking in the book... I'll just to talk a little more about ease, because it's such a great subject. You were talking in your book, Enough Already, The Power of Radical Contentment, about... Finding mentors who have ease in areas that you're not proficient in. I think you should talk a little bit about that because that was such a great section. Yes. Um, many years ago when I started doing seminars, I did relatively small groups, but I was very nervous about the logistics. I wanted to make sure everyone was taken care of and all the rooms were properly handled. And you know, I was, I, I, My nervousness around it was, hampered my effectiveness. And then around that time, I attended a huge psychology conference at Princeton University, probably 2,000 participants. And just before the opening lecture, I saw the director of the conference standing on the steps of the lecture hall with his clipboard, just chatting with somebody and laughing and having a good old time. And he provided a role model for me that you can have a huge responsibility like that and still be easy. And in that moment, it broke my belief system that I had to stress and be nervous about taking care of 20 people compared to 2,000. And, and that was many, many years ago. And I often return to him and that memory of that image as a role model for how I can be. Now, if I ever start to get nervous about anything, I remember him. I think, well, he's helped me for the rest of my life. I don't even remember his name. I never talked to him. But... In that one moment, he served me for my entire life. And so I think we could all do well to choose a role model of ease that we can call to mind whenever we start to be stressed. Well, you're definitely, uh, for me, a role model to ease uh, for writing. I look at you and I look at the output that you put out. There came a time some time ago where I realized that the stress that I had put into writing was extra, and that if I'm actually doing my job, there is no stress in the writing process. Well said. Well yeah, because said. if you're looking for the outcome rather than being in the process of writing, you stress yourself. So that is really fun, and oftentimes we get people who come who are aspiring actors, writers, life coaches, and there's this tension around them, right. and it, it's 
that's something extra that, that you really don't need. Well, you know, you said it perfectly, Shia, because if you're writing for a particular result, you're going to get hung up. But if you're writing for the joy of saying what you want to say, then there's absolute joy and success in the process, regardless of what happens. Um, I've written like 24 books or something like that, and I've never written a book for a result. I've always written only because there's something I really wanted to say, even if no one else ever read it, it would be fun to write it. And the good news is that you know people seem to like it and they keep buying the books. But even if they didn't, I would keep writing just for the sheer joy of letting that energy flow and channeling that information and inspiration. That's great. Speaking of uh, life coaches, just going back to that, you mentioned on the break we, we had a chance to chat that you are offering a life coach training in September. Do you want to tell people about that? Yes, I do this once a year for people who would like to become a professional life coach or employ life coaching skills in their current profession or just use it for the personal edification. It's an intensive six-month program that's mostly teleseminars online and includes a four-day retreat in Ojai, California. And we've had phenomenal results with this program over the last three or four years. People's lives change as they become a coach. And then, of course, they do step into coaching. So uh, I love it. I do it because it's thrilling to me, and I meet wonderful people. And if anybody's interested in joining me, uh, they can go to my website, alancohen.com, A-L-A-N. C-O-H-E-N. That's A-L-A-N-1-L-C-O-H-E-N. Yep, that's it. Dot com. It's pretty simple. Really? Very excellent. I, I actually want to uh, have you talk about another, it's, it's kind of a slide in from E, another segment of your book. I, I love the No Dramas Mate chapter. Yeah. And how you discuss how drama can be an, an addiction. addiction and people have a comfort zone. Talk to people a little bit about that well you know observing my own dramas and the dramas of people i work with i've learned absolutely that drama is a choice (laughs) and i've seen people make huge dramas out of nothing and i've seen people take what would appear to be huge drama and just kind of sail through it with a sense of ease and trust so you know what we make of drama is what we experience And uh, another piece of that is that drama can become an addiction in which you're so used to having dramas on a daily basis and your life becomes a series of fires to put out and emergencies to handle that you wouldn't know what to do if you didn't have a drama. And so um, I, I recommend to people to find out who you'd be without drama and just test it. And I think Norman Vincent Peale said handle emergencies in a casual fashion. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it's an ongoing practice for me. I still have temptations to see drama, but the more I can step back and say, hmm, how would I be treating this if this was not a drama, suddenly I get a perspective and <laughs> it ends up working for everybody. Well, you know, when you were saying that, I got this idea, I had this thought about ADD. Yes. Now, ADD is attention deficit disorder. Right. Everybody needs attention. Right. And if they're in a deficit of attention, they do things to gather attention. Right. And that's creating drama. Right. And uh, so it's really about, my estimation, being heard. And uh, if you listen to somebody, they don't need to get dramatic about it. Right. But again, it feeds that need for attention. Right. So, We've been raised in a culture of drama. Right. I mean, did you watch the Academy Awards? Right. <laughs> <laughs> a culture of drama? A culture of drama. Yeah. Well, you know, my partner and I, Dee, have been watching movies since we've been together for about 12 years, almost every night. And uh, within the last year or two, we got tired of dramas. We just, <laughs> the energy of a movie drama just feels heavy to us. Yes. And we just, we just don't go there anymore. And if something gets, you know, too intense, we just, we just don't watch it because it's just not a match for our energy or our intentions. And so to me, that's kind of like a metaphor. You're like, you know, we're all watching the movie of life. And if we choose, we can, you know, it's, all, it's also like, you know, a multiplex theater. Like in one, 
And one in one theater you have a blowing up movie, another you got a sex movie, another you got a children's movie, another you have a fantasy, and you basically have you know whatever you can walk into whatever door you choose, and you know so we, you can choose in the multiplex of life to step out of the heavy drama theater and go into a comedy if you choose. You know it's all up to each of us. Right. Do you find that it's harder for? the folks that you're working with to step out of the dramas of their life, if they're still blaming their parents for uh, the quality of their lives today? Well, sure. Any Anytime you're blaming anyone for anything, you're stuck in that consciousness. So whether it's your parents 40 years ago or the government today or your wife or your husband today, it matters not. It's the dynamic of blame that undermines our joy. Yeah. We've noticed that most people don't, really want to be responsible for how their lives are showing up. Right, right, right. I, you know, when I was first with Z years ago, I did have a habit of making her wrong. You know, it was just something I carried over from whatever. And, uh, you know, this, we were seeing each other for like three or four or five months, and w- she looked at me one day and she said, you know, I really... I don't like it when you make me wrong. It doesn't feel good. And if we're going to be in a relationship, it's just not going to work. Good and, for her. Yeah. And the way she said it was with love and compassion and clarity. And I heard it. You know, I didn't go into defense or counterattack. I thought, hmm, well, I, I really care about this person. And I want to be with her. And if me making her wrong is going to stand in the way of that, I don't want to do that. And so I gradually began to lighten up on it. And it's... It's it virtually disappeared, you know, by this point. But, you know, I needed to become aware that I was stepping into a blame mode before I could do something about it. You know, normally at the top of each show, we talk about our three principles of instantaneous transformation. And you just gave us a, a good segue to it because the first principle is anything you resist persists and grows stronger. So when you say you listen to D and you didn't go into defense mode, that that's like resisting the communication. And you're also talking about the third principle, which is that you saw it without judging it. When you see something that you're doing mechanically without judging it, it disappears. Well, I have this idea that you become kinder to yourself and therefore you're kinder to D. Because you well, see, also, when, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> when I stopped working on me, I stopped working on Ariel because she's an extension of me. Right. And, you know, we want to look good to ourselves and to others, and so we try to rearrange how we appear in the universe. And if our partner does something <laughs> that looks stupid to us, well, we're down their throat. Right. You know, it's all a big projection. We, we don't really see our partner. We see our idea of who our partner is. <laughs> or should be. Yeah. And our idea of who our partner is is a direct projection extension of who we believe we are. So you really hit it on the money there, uh, Shia, because... You know, as, as much as I love myself, that's how much I'm capable of loving others. And, you know, you can, you can practice on loving others, loving yourself. Either way, it'll work both ends of the spectrum. Uh, someone once said, hurt people hurt people. Yes, and so I like that. And so somebody is nasty to you, they must be really hurt and they're spilling over. You, you can also say, love people, love people. So, you, you know, it's, it's an ongoing practice of discovering where the love lives. Right. Well, I've always noticed that, uh, you know, when somebody is rude or uh, nasty to me, I, I know that if I fight with them or disagree with them, I become just like them. Right. And that serves nothing. Have you ever heard, never wrestle with a pig, you both get <laughs> dirty and the pig likes it? <laughs> <laughs> Not that people are pigs, but, you know, there's a, you might call it a pig consciousness. Actually, I love pigs, but, you know, it's a metaphor. That if, if somebody's being petty or nasty or demeaning to you, and you meet them at that frequency, well, then you're both there. But well, you know, you, I have this. Go ahead. 
have this little thing called their life is their punishment. <laughs> because when somebody's being nasty, they have to live in that nastiness. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they punish themselves. So their life becomes their punishment. And, you know, you can't save people that don't want to be saved. Right, right. Yeah. But, you know, you and I can save ourselves by doing our best to take the high road and to live in the frequency we would choose regardless of the frequencies other people are choosing for themselves or they would attempt to impose on us. But, you know, I, I have... We were doing a, 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 an evening group recently where a guy came up and he asked us about free, free choice, free will versus determinism. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have this sense that most people don't have free will, that their lives are mechanically determined by uh, a stimulus response reaction to life that then dictates how they behave. Yeah. And that you only get free will when you start to become aware of your mechanical resistances to life. Right. Your 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 no to life rather than your yes to life. Which you described so brilliantly earlier. You walk down the stairs after having this enlightening moment, this glorious meditation. You come downstairs and you have an automatic no to the headless rat with its gut sticking out. But you have the ability not to jump into, jump that into the no, but to see it. Right. And, and so the, it's like a soundtrack that runs alongside the movie, but you don't have to embody it. And it's so wonderful that you can do that. And you know, um, you just keyed me into a fabulous experience. Uh, do we have time during this segment for me to tell we it? We have another minute. We have about a minute. Okay, I was on an airplane listening to an MP3 of a fabulous lecture, and I was sitting in the front row, and the airplane movie was playing right in front of me, and I couldn't not see it because it was inches for me. Uh, but I could, I could watch it. Just, I could, it, was a, it was kind of a lame teenage romance, and I could figure out the whole plot without, watching, without hearing the sound. And that was the story for the whole, um, the whole plane ride. And I realized by the end of the plane ride, this is a metaphor for life, that there is a movie going on. It may be a very thin, lame movie. You can be aware of it with a portion of your consciousness. But meanwhile, keep listening to the great lecture because the great lecture is always being downloaded if you're willing to put your major attention on that. Right. Uh, this, this is, That's a great this, place it, for us it, to go to is, a break on. It is. And, uh, Excellent. Yes. We're talking with Alan Cohen today. His website's alancohen.com. We'll be back shortly. So come on back. And don't miss being, being here. here. The Seventh Wave Channel on The Voice America Network. Want success in every part of your life? Then join the club, the Excellence Club, the Canes online community of people bringing excellence to all aspects of their lives. Call and ask questions on being here. Write comments on the Transformational Moments blog and take excellence to a new level in the Premium Excellence Club. Get the newest articles, podcasts, and weekly videos, plus enlightening advice. Join at TransformationMadeEasy.com by clicking on the Excellence Club. That's TransformationMadeEasy.com, the Excellence Club. Excellence Club. Think of the world 50 years ago. Now think of this same world and how it'll be 50 years from now. Did you know that if the world's population continues to grow at its current rate, our children and grandchildren will only have 25% of the resources per capita that our parents and grandparents had? We must preserve the foundation of a quality standard of living. That foundation starts with Go Green Radio. Join your host, Jill Buck, for Go Green Radio every Friday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific on Voice America. This is the 7th Wave Channel on the Voice America Network.
You are listening to Being Here with hosts Ariel and Shia Kane. If you would like to participate in today's conversation, please call now. The toll-free number is 1-866-472-5795. Again, 1-866-472-5795. Now, back to Being Here. Welcome back to Being Here. Uh, For those of you who may be interested, Shai and I are doing a course on intimacy in New York City, beginning of June, the 1st through the 3rd. You can find out more about that on our website, transformationmadeeasy.com. By the way, if you haven't already liked us on Facebook, you can do that. Our Facebook page is Transformation Made Easy, and you will see on the left-hand side there that we have... One of uh, our friends or one of our likes is Alan Cohen, so you may as well go up there and like him at the same time because I'm sure you're liking him today. Alan, you still with us? Oh, yes. I go wherever I'm liked. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way. Uh, you know, I, I, we were talking on the break about being your own guru, and I know you have lots of great things to talk about that with folks. Well, it's one of my favorite themes. The word guru is spelled G-U-R-U. And so it tells me that the way to the real guru is authenticity. So I, I just love this theme that whatever you're searching for outside by way of wisdom or guidance or power is already in each of us. And I learned this one day when I was at Omega Institute. I know you've been there. And um, I was walking to breakfast, and this lady sitting by the side of the path asked me, do you know what time it is? And I didn't have a watch, so I took a guess. I said, I think it's about 8.45. And she said, oh, no. It was 8.45 half an hour ago, <laughs> and I kept walking and thinking, well, she knew that it was 8.45 half an hour ago. Why did she need to ask me? <laughs> and the answer is that she was just looking for confirmation. Right. And, and so I practiced this in my seminars, and uh, many years ago I learned that if somebody, in the, somebody in the seminar coaching says, I don't know, the response is, if you did know, what would you know? And you'd be amazed what people come up with. One, one fellow once said, well, I don't know where my passion lives. And I said, well, if you did know what you're passionate about, what would you be doing? He said, oh, I'd be skydiving and doing music, and there's a woman I'd ask for a date. And the, the audience just broke out into laughter and applause because it was very clear that someplace inside him, he really did know, but he was looking for somebody to tell him. So, you know, a good teacher, a guru, puts himself out of a job in the sense that, you know, you don't want people leaning on you or looking to you as the answer man or woman, but you, if you can just, if, if we could each just find the answers inside ourselves, it would shorten our journey so much, we'd have so much more fun. Well, how do you reach that state, though, where you start trusting your own natural knowing? Right. Because so much of our lives is, are based on the initial programming in the first six years of our lives right. when we absorb the culture we grow up in that, and we believe that to be true. That's how you know, uh, prejudice is passed on from generation to generation. It doesn't, somebody doesn't have to say to hate somebody else who's different. They just have to... Uh, have a look in their eye when they see somebody who's different, and the child absorbs it and holds it as the truth. So how do you convert from what you've learned growing up into starting to look and see what your truth is? Well, you have to. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, you have to understand that that program you received covered your knowing, but it didn't replace it. Um, one of my teachers is Abraham of Abraham Hicks, and somebody once said to Abraham, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And Abraham answered, you have no idea what an old dog you are, <laughs> meaning that the real you and the core you run so much deeper than any illusions that have been placed over it. And the good news is that it takes a lot less work or action to get back to that source than it did to cover it over. So the, the suggestion I often give folks is to practice acting on your intuition. If you have a gut feeling to do something or not to do something or to say yes or say no, and in your body you feel it, and in your emotions you feel, I would really prefer to do this or not, just move with it 
and watch what happens. And sometimes you mess up, but almost all the time you will discover that there was a part of you that absolutely knew your right place in the universe. And when you trusted that and acted on it, miracles happened. So true. Absolutely our experience, too. I really love that. I, I think people sometimes, though, Alan, mistakenly think that those intuitive things have to be big things. And they, it, your intuition happen in little ways every day. And people get so busy going somewhere, I think they disregard them. It's part of why we were telling people at the top of the show to listen in their body as well. well. I see it sim- sort of simply like the gas station. You know, sometimes I know I need to get gas in my car, but I'm busy going somewhere, so I put it off. Right. Now, I never put it off too long because I don't run out of gas. I haven't done that in years. But the, even though I know I should stop and get gas, I'm going somewhere, so I don't... Just do it. I, I'm trying to get to what I think is more important. You do that, does it add an element of stress to your life? Absolutely add stress. You know, like, will we make it home? <laughs> 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 the gamble is on. Now, we drive a Prius, so we get some pretty good gas miles, so we make it home. But uh, that being said, uh, it's... Uh, uh, there's this tendency to... It's part of the conditioning of our culture is to drive yourself to get what you think is important and you miss your own intuitive knowing because you're going somewhere. Right. And we're back to the idea that it's somewhere out there and if I could just get there, everything would be all right. When, you know, you intu- you know, intuition is not just an inspirational mode, but it's a guiding and organizing principle so what I find is that when I, when I do act on my intuition, it works for everyone. And there's this principle I teach in my courses called no private good, which means that if something is really good for me on the deepest level, it can't be bad for someone else. A quick example, Dee and I were at a restaurant in Seattle a couple summers ago, and we were seated under an air conditioning unit. And we got kind of cold, and even though the uh, meal had partly been served already, we, we asked the waiter to change this. We felt a little sheepish about changing midstream, but we decided to move with our intuition. So he gave us another table, and then five minutes later, an elderly couple came in and sat at the table we had vacated. And the moment they sat down, the man said, ah, air conditioning, just what I needed. <laughs> So, Perfect. so the idea is that when we were actually willing to trust our instinct and move with what would work for us, it did not rob someone else of their good, but it actually enabled someone else to have their good. Yes. You know, you talked, uh, uh, or we were talking a little bit about one of your favorite parts of your book, Enough Already, The Power of Radical Contentment. i got to say the title of it again for folks. I noticed that there were a couple things at the beginning that I, in particular, really loved. And when you were talking about that contentment doesn't mean complacency, that it's really this balance of being happy and hungry. Right. And that the enough already part, I'm going to do a quote from the book, everybody. This is a quote. Enough already can also mean refusing to accept anything not in harmony with your well-being. And that's what Alan's talking about here. And also, I saw today when we were talking with one of our clients who's struggling in their relationship because they really want it to work out over time, but right now there are things happening between her and her boyfriend that aren't in harmony with her well-being. And it's really, as you say in other places in, the book about putting your foot down and saying your truth, having the courage to be you with your values and your truth rather than trying to get it to work out and go to, in this case, marriage. Right. Well, it's a fabulous point. And, you know, so many people are, are, are resigned to sacrifice and they've been raised in religion or culture that says, well, the more you put yourself down, the more you help other people. 
But my experience is that the more I put myself down, the more I hurt other people because then I become a depressed and boring and sick person. And what kind of contribution are you making to the planet from that consciousness? So it's absolutely incumbent upon us to say no to any situation that is abusive or demeaning or creating strife or struggle that's unnecessary. And the truth is that if somebody is abusing you, it's not helping them any more than it's helping you to stay in that situation. So really, asking for what you want, if it requires a change, is as important as being happy with what you have without a change. Is it one of those paradoxes? You know, it, it sounds like you're saying two opposing things, love what you want, but at the same time... Love what, what you got. got. But, but it's, they're, they're both true. You have to really go for your truth. Well, the, the way I resolve that is that you love what you have, of course, but then if you have a desire or an intention or a vision to have something different, love that as well. The process of asking for more and improving and expanding and growing is as much a part of contentment as enjoying what you have. So it, it's both simultaneously. It's not one at the expense of the other. Right. Well said. I, I like this idea that contentment doesn't mean complacency either. You know, I, frequently we have people think that if you're enlightened, you just sit and meditate all day. Or you become the world's largest couch potato. And, and it's been our experience that the more we get into the current moment of our lives, the more productive and satisfied and effective we are. Right. Well said. And sometimes it doesn't mean you're doing a lot. You're not having to do all the time. Well, I like what you just said about doing. Mm -hmm. See, people think they have to do something with what they discover when they become aware of how they're operating in their life. And it's not about doing something different. It's about being aware of what you're right. doing. Then you have a choice as to whether or not to continue doing that or being in that relationship. When, when you're established in your being, the doing comes naturally. But if you try to get to being by doing, you just end up with doo-doo. <laughs> <laughs> you are good. That was great. <laughs> That's right up there with wrestling with a pig. <laughs> right. I have a lot of graphic examples. It's kind of bringing heaven to earth in an odd way. <laughs> You have a way with words, Mr. Cohen, a way with yes, words. Yes, you do. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> By the way, you can find him on alancohen.com. I know I said that a bunch of times, but I had to say it one more time. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. We, we, uh, this is one of those dangerous spots. You know, we, we completed something there, and then there's this empty space of, you know, creativity now. Where do we go from here? Well, let's celebrate the space. You know, it's kind of funny. I was just talking to a friend of mine, Panash Desai, a lovely teacher, and he called me. We just talked about fun stuff, and we got so high talking that we just both went silent for a couple minutes. And right. I thought, well, you know, and there was a big conversation going on in the silence, and finally one of us said, well, I guess that about says all. <laughs> and I know you can't do that on, on radio, but, you know, let's, let's put in a plug for for the fullness of silence, because in that space, it's the womb for the next embryo to, to be planted and grow. Right. Well, I know we have about three minutes left on this show, and I know one of the things you often do on your show is a little guided meditation. you want to just take a moment? And... Sure, sure. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity. So let's all take a breath together. As you're listening, I invite all of our listeners to drop into the place of wholeness that we've been talking about. Inside you and all of us right now, there is a complete and powerful and beautiful and all-knowing being as you were created by the universe. And so let's take just a moment now to let go of all the striving and the doing and the struggling and the hoping and the worrying and take refuge in our true self. Your true self is absolutely perfect as it is. It needs no fixing. It needs no alteration. It is created by God as a wholeness. And so let us feel for a moment the power and the wonder 
of who we really are in our natural state. And from this natural wholeness, all good, all doing, all right relationships, all financial well-being, all passion, all creative success springs. And we can move forth into our evening or our day, wherever we are, with a sense of happy lightness, knowing that we are in the right place, the right purpose, and only good can come from us trusting the wholeness of our true being. That is beautiful, Alan. So it is. So it is. So it is. It's been our true pleasure to have Alan on this show today. Yes, thank thank you you so much. Thank you so much, Alan. And mine. Share the show with your friends. You know, it's easy enough to forward it. Take care. Facebook. Take care of the people around you. It makes it so much easier to live your life when you're sharing your light with others. It's been our pleasure to be here with you today. We're looking forward to coming back next week. So, come on back. Yeah, and don't miss being here. here.